presenter is going to be Chris Rapp from French Girlman. So what we'll do is we'll have him go through his slide. We'll be monitoring the chat, uh, but there will be time afterwards. Uh, we'll open it up uh, to open discussion and take questions then as well. So feel free to either uh, keep note of your question or fill it in in the chat and we will cover it as we go along. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris. All right, hello everyone. Uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen out there. If you could confirm that real quick. Yep, looks good. Okay, thank you. Um, so welcome to Energy Conservation Part 3. Uh, today we're going to review power products. So just a quick outline for um, today's presentation is a brief introduction to myself. Uh, we're going to talk about what energy conservation is and why it's important. Uh, we're going to look at the relationship between energy, energy conservation and electric motors. Then we're going to do an overview of variable frequency drives and their load types, and then also look at VFDs and power quality. Um, hopefully at the end of this presentation, you can have an understanding of how to appropriately look at energy conservation in regards to electric motors and VFDs. So just a quick introduction, right? My name is Chris Rapp. I've been supporting the VFD market for over 15 years. Um, I've put a VFD on everything from a elevator in a, a guy's backyard to, you know, your, ten, um, your, your highest tension applications, winding applications, um, and even installed VFDs on the, the gateway arch when they did the expansion um, recently. So um, I represent the power products manager for French Grillman. I've been in that position for about two and a half years now, specializing in Rockwell power products, um, power flex drives and systems, centerline motor control centers and power quality products. Uh, when I'm not working, I enjoy time with my family. I've got a, a wife and a three-year-old son and a three-month-year-old son, so we stay busy. Um, we can pretty much find us doing anything outside, and when I'm not with them, I enjoy riding my motorcycle. So um, enough about me. We'll talk about energy conservation. And one of the things I wanted to bring up is the difference between energy conservation and energy efficiency. Um, those are often misunderstood. So Energy efficiency is using technology that requires less energy to do the same function. Um, so you might be able to relate to this as in changing out your light bulbs um, to, from incandescent to compact fluorescent or, or LED. Um, energy conservation is any behavior that results in the use of less energy. So um, you might be able to relate to this and your, as you were growing up, your parents, you know, either politely or not politely, reminding you to turn the lights off when you left the room. Um, or in today's standards, a lot of new cars uh, have energy conservation by starting and stopping that engine when you're sitting at a stoplight, right? They're, they're conserving fuel. Um, so this presentation is going to focus on energy conservation. So really, what is the importance of energy conservation, right? There's a lot of different factors that go into energy conservation. It's important, but I feel like um, the top four are environmental impacts, and those are often driven by federal, state, or corporate um, initiatives or regulations that have to be held, um, or financial impacts, right? You might have an organization that says, hey, we need, we're spending a lot on energy costs, we need to try to reduce those. Um, or in a case of you know, recent Texas where they lost power um, due to their grid, supply and demand might have been beneficial for users if, if industrial users were cognitive of their energy conservation and could have put more power back on the grid for everyone else. So. Um, supply and demand can play a role in that. Um, one that's important and true to me is the future generations, right? Um, trying to leave this place in a better, better um, than what we found it, right? Leave it for our future generations to be able to enjoy. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of other aspects that can be looked at. Energy conservation is why it's important, but those are kind of four that I, four that I felt were important. So when we talk about you know, power conservation and energy conservation, there's many ways that we can kind of think about power conservation, such as, you know, putting in efficient light, efficient lighting, um, where you go and change out all the light bulbs, um, or you might do renewable energy, where you're actually using other energy sources to, you know, offset the use of electrical energy, um, or maybe something like power factor correction. Those are all different avenues of power conservation. Uh, when we look at energy conservation in today's presentation, we're going to actually look at electric motors, right? So um, electric motors are used in today's industry for everything from conveyors um, to simple pumps and fans. So um, all over our industry, in our residential homes, and in our industrial users, um, we're using electric motors, right? The electric motor has been 
around since I think it was like 1887 or 1900s when um, Nikola Tesla invented the AC motor. Um, actually, fun fact for the day is the AC power, right, was introduced um, by Nikola Tesla at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. That's really where it take off and, and kind of went away from the DC power from Thomas Edison. So there's your fun fact for the day. It's not going to be on the quiz. Um, and the reason why I'm focusing on energy conservation and electric motors is the Department of Energy estimates electric motors consume roughly 50% of all electrical energy in the U.S. So half of the energy produced in the U.S. goes to an electric motor. Um, if we look at that on an industrial scale for, for industrial years, more than 85% of the electrical produced or electricity produced goes to electric motors. So put that in perspective, right? Our industrial users, every $100 $85 is, is contributed to an electric motor. So you can see why, you know, looking at electric motors and power is a good energy conservation. So now that we understand um, electric motors and what they do and why we use them, let's, let's take a look at common motor control methods, right? So one of those methods is going to be a motor starter. Motor starter can often be a, called a direct across the line starter, meaning you just have a short circuit protection device, a contactor that closes a contact, so just much like a light switch, and your motor goes full on, speeds full on, there's no regulation. Um, that's called a motor starter, commonly used um, in many, many applications. Another, another uh, motor control method is going to be a soft starter. So just hence the name, we softly start that motor. Uh, we take our same short circuit protection device and we feed AC power through a SCR device that just slowly starts that motor. We can't vary the speed of it. We just slowly start it. Uh, what we're going to focus on today is going to be our variable frequency drives. Uh, these are these are pieces of equipment that run through. Uh, we take that AC power again, short circuit protection device. We run that through an AC drive, and now we can, hence the name, variable frequency drive. We can vary the speed of that motor. So not only are we soft starting it, but we're also varying the speed of that motor. So. Let's get an understanding of electric motors and those motor common common motor control methods. And I want you to visualize being in your car. And I realize, you know, a lot of days nowadays people don't really drive, especially during the week. But um, let's visualize you're in your car at a stoplight and you got your foot on the brake, but there is no gas pedal. And you may be saying, okay, well, if there's no gas pedal, how do I get around? Well, that's because your engine's going full speed. So your brake is actually holding the car stopped from a full speed, right? Your engine's sitting there, it's ready to go. You're holding it back, green light goes, what's gonna happen? You're gonna burn out, you're gonna take off. Um, the car's gonna get from point A to point B really fast, right? You're gonna have fun doing it probably because we all like to go fast. Um, but think about what's gonna happen to the mechanical and the devices in the car, right? You're gonna burn up your tires. You're gonna, you're gonna burn up your brakes by holding back the motor. Uh, it's going to be a really aggressive control. Um, if you think about this scenario, a lot of electric motors operate in that same scenario, right? Um, if you think about the, the motor starter direct across the line, that's the same thing, right? We're, we're applying power full um, directly to it through a light switch, turning it on immediately, and we're getting a large inrush. So ever since the electric motor was created um, by Nikola Tesla, we've been trying to create or control the speed of the motor. So we've been doing that by installing line shafts with different, um, with different belts and pulleys that create different actual shaft speeds out on driven equipment on a production floor. Or we've been doing that by mechanical devices such as brakes and things um, to be able to control the speed. So over the last few decades, um, our uh, baby boomer generation created what we call variable frequency drives, um, also known as VFDs, um, VSDs, variable speed drives, ASD, adjustable speed drives, inverters, um, AC drive, or one of my personal favorites, a freak drive. Um, there is a lot of even um, electrical industry people, electricians, that don't really understand how a VFD works. They just know that um, it turns that motor and it's, it's a drive. So they, they like to call it a freak drive. Um, quick, quick theory behind a drive, right? Is we take AC power into it. We have a converter bridge that's built out of diodes. We convert that AC power into DC power. The DC power is then filtered down and sent over to an inverter section where we have IGBTs that create a pulse width modulated output 
that looks like a sine wave. That AC sine wave that we're talking about is what our lights and, and a motor like to run on, right? Nikola Tesla created AC power and he also created the AC induction motor. Um, AC, since that motor was created on AC sine wave, that's what it wants to see to run. So the drive creates this AC sine wave by what we call pulse width modulated output. All these ups and downs and gaps in between is what we vary and adjust to create the speed of the motor that we need. So we're not gonna get into depth of this, but VFD motor technology um, really advanced over the last few decades where we're able to control the motor. At first, we really just had simple speed controllers where we would be running a, a volts per hertz, what we call it, and the motor would just run at a simple speed as simple speed controller. Um, as the technology advanced, we got into what we call centerless vector, and now we're doing a little bit more positioning control and speed control. Um, so now we're moving conveyors to certain positions and we're moving that motor to certain positions. Um, and then as technology advanced, we moved over to flux vector control and we're doing torque control applications. Um, so now we can use AC drives and motors to do some of your heaviest torque applications and winding applications and simple, um, excuse me, sensitive winding applications such as tissue where you don't want to um, tear the paper and things like that. Um, high torque applications such as boats where you're pulling them through locks and dams where you're not really running on a speed control, but you're running on a torque, you're pulling um, certain power. So VFDs have really advanced um, since, the, since the 80s when they were created and nowadays are really more prevalent. Um, VFDs are, are quite common in, in the industry to run motors. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the VFD load types. And these are important. We're going to look at two of the three different load types for VFDs. Um, one of those is going to be variable torque. These are things such as centrifugal blowers, um, pumps, your fans, your compressors. And what's important about variable torque loads is the load varies with the speed, right? So if we think about it, we turn this fan on, we start turning this fan, there's not going to be a lot of airflow through this fan until it gets up to speed. So the, the load varies with the speed. It's a variable torque load. The next load type that we're gonna talk about is gonna be constant torque load, right? So we have conveyors, augers, positive, uh, excuse me, extruders, or positive displacement pumps. These are load types where the load is on all the time. So we have a constant torque, right? Um, think about starting this conveyor. There's product on here, you stop it, you start it, that load is gonna be there all the time. Same thing as an auger. Um, if you stop this and you hit the start button, that load is there as soon as you hit the start button. So unlike a variable torque load, the load is there full time. And it's important to talk about the different load types because when we start talking about energy conservation, we get into the point that variable torque loads follow affinity laws. And if you remember from your engineering school, or maybe you haven't learned yet, affinity laws are what govern the relationship between speed and other variables. So let's take a look at those. I don't expect you to remember those. And what we're gonna look at is these three graphs. And the first one here is our flow or volume. It simply states that flow or volume is a one-to-one -one ratio with speed. It's per uh, perpendicular linear with speed, right? Zero speed, zero flow, 100% speed, 100% flow. If we look at our pressure, our head pressure, our percentage, um, that's at a rate of cube of speed. So we do we do vary in between there. Um, if you look at the, the one we're going to pay pay attention to is going to be graph C, the power energy consumption, and this rate this changes at a rate of cubed, right? So if 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 we change our speed by ten percent, now we're reducing our power by thirty percent, right? So here's here's where we get to start talking about energy conservation. One thing to keep in mind though, is constant torque loads do not follow affinity laws. So that's why I tried to identify the two different type of loads. Um, if you remember, I mentioned that there was actually three load types. One is called constant horsepower. Um, and that's not a load that's really used commonly in the industry. That's for tooling design and CNC machines. So we're not, we don't really, really wanna get involved in that one today. Um, so when we think about motor control, 
in valve, or excuse me, motor control and VFDs, I want to put this into perspective and, and look at a typical valve control, right? So let's think about your water, wastewater industry. Um, think about the water tower in your, in your city or your town that they're pumping water into that provides the, the pressure, the water pressure coming down through your piping, right? Um, this is a typical valve control. So let's take a look at this application. Um, the system, <clears throat> excuse me, is designed for a maximum of, of 160 gallons per minute, and the flow and the head pressure is 120 foot-pounds of head pressure. So they've identified that normal operation is only 80 gallons per minute, and they can do minimum of 30 foot of head pressure. So how does that play out? Well, engineering firm sits down and they create a system curve with the system demands, right? Um, maximum 160 at 120 and minimum 30 of head pressure and then they go out and they pick out a pump and they the pump follows that performance curve um there's it's important to remember that the performance curve of the pump doesn't change right so how does this play out in an actual application let's go ahead and take it into a real world scenario so how do they do this they 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 say they want 160 gallons per minute but they say natural or excuse me average is 80 gallons per minute well, we do that by a mechanical throttling device. And this would be like a valve. So if you think about a piping scenario, you would go and turn your valve to half off. You want half flow. If you remember our affinity law for the volume, we're directly proportional to speed. So if we want half flow, we're going to go to half speed. So here's a representation, um, graphical representation of our throttling device, right? We've, we've got the throttling device on half, on half the valve. Um, and this would have been, you know, a person actually going out. So if we think about a town, right, uh, they have a water, water, wastewater municipality. Um, you have individuals that would actually have to go out and at nighttime, typically they would go out and open this valve to 100%, fill up the water tower overnight. And then the, the rest of the day, this would go back to 50% at their 80 gallons per minute and just sit there um, all day long at 80 gallons per minute, right? This is a manual throttling device. Um, I'm sure at some point this became an electronic throttling device where they would so they didn't have to send somebody out manually to go change it. Um, but that's pretty much how all of, you know, water's been around for many, many years. So you can imagine all of the pumps and everything that are around and all the electrical controls and mechanical controls that are out there um, in this exact scenario, um, running, running in half, um, excuse me, at full speed at half capacity by some type of throttling device. Um, well, if you take into consideration those affinity laws again, we can we can take a look at another way to achieve 80 gallons per minute, um, and that's by reducing the speed, right? Well, if we remember our direct across the line starter and our soft starters and our VFDs, um, how are we going to vary the speed? We're going to put in a variable frequency drive, right? So if we look at that same system curve, but now we look at the 80 gallons per minute flow with the variable speed, you can see what that relationship looks like on a graph. And when I put that over the top of the last graph for the mechanical throttling device, you can really start to see the difference in energy, right? That would be this whole blue area. Um, that's the energy saved on this application. Um, so again, as we, as we change the speed, um, we, we change the power consumption by a third, um, thanks to our affinity laws. So, Hopefully that's a good understanding of where of, of like a water wastewater um, pumping scenario and how we would use a mechanical throttling device or, or a VFD and the, the cost savings associated with the VFD or excuse me, the energy savings with the VFD is here, but let's take a look at like what the cost savings would be. So, um, you know, everybody always says, right, show me the money. It's about the money. So let's take a look at just a simple 30 horsepower motor, 24 seven operation. Um, and I'm saying this is an annual operational cost of around 13 K. And, and you'll ask me, well, where did you get that? So on every, uh, just go out to Google and search a VFD savings calculator. And there's many of them out there. Um, I use this one reference down here. Um, and I put in simple motor data for 30 horsepower motor. Um, I put in a VFD cost for an average 30 horsepower VFD. And then I went in and put in um, the local utility rate for St. Louis industrial users, which is 5.2 cents. All right, and it gives me an estimated annual cost of $13,340 to run that 30 horsepower motor. So it costs 
you know, 13K to run, run that 30 horsepower motor 24 seven. So what if we were to put a VFD on there? What kind of, what kind of savings are we gonna get on a VFD? Well, let's just take that scenario that we just talked about 24 seven, 30 horsepower. And let's put a VFD on there. We're still gonna have a mechanical throttling device out there. We're gonna put a VFD on there, but we're gonna run it at 90%. If we think about our water or wastewater um, opportunity example, we needed 80 gallons per minute on average, but 160 gallons per minute was the design. And then we used the throttling device. So they probably never really pumped 160 gallons per minute, right? So running at 90% is probably going to be totally sufficient for the application. They would still use their throttling device to get down to the 80 gallons per minute, but they'd be saving a little bit of energy. So that's how we, we're going to run at 90%. Um, speed all the time, 24-7, seven, seven days a week, that estimated cost of VFD operation is $10,211. So that's $3,130 basically of savings um, that we're going to get just by slowing the motor down um, 10%, right? And you might not say that's very much, but it, it adds up. And as a payback, that's less than two years. So for an industrial user, right? Hey, Mr. Customer, um, let's look at this water wastewater application that you've got and the way that it pumps and let's look at your motor control right we could possibly install a vfd and after two years that paid for that installation right every year after that now you're saving that money um, but let's take that one step further let's actually look at that if we were to put that in a true operation scenario with a vfd um, in that scenario, we would typically our average was 50% speed right 80 gallons of flow per minute. So on that, we would say, okay, maximum, we're never going to get above 80% speed. Yeah, it's designed for 160, but that's worst case scenario, right? Um, average, we've, we've identified that 80% is our maximum, and the pump really doesn't flow, uh, doesn't provide enough flow or head pressure less than 40% speed. So in between there, we're going to go 5% of the time, roughly, but 80% 80, 80 of the time, we're going to be at that 50% to maintain um, water flow as we need it. So if we look at that application now, same 30 horsepower motor, right? 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, our estimated, uh, excuse me, estimated operational, annual operational cost is now $2,196, right? So quite a bit difference there. Um, when we were slowed it down to 90% speed, our operational cost per year was 10,200. Now that we're modulating speed mainly 50% and then all, all around that, now we're at $2,200, let's call it. So um, you start looking at an annual savings of $11,100 or a payback time of five months. Now you really start talking some savings, right? You're going to start per perking some years up. Um, it really starts to come into fruition of how energy conservation can, can really start to save some dollars and be a financial impact for some of your users. Um, not only is it is it better for the environment and everyone else, but you're also saving money. And at some points, uh, or excuse me, at some instances, at the end of the day, a lot of people, and especially in the corporate world, care about that dollar, right? So it's being able to justify um, your existence, um, being able to show that dollar amount. So these are these are good two um, visual dollar examples of, of just a 30 horsepower application, but think about the several hundred horsepowers of application that this could be relative to. Um, another thing to think about is we talked about a, a water or wastewater application or a pumping application. Um, this same, same exact scenario could be used for a variable torque load such as a fan or an HVAC system. There's many HVAC systems out there that run with a fan full on and then they operate dampers and the dampers control the airflow where they need them. So um, if they were to keep the dampers full open and then operate the fan at the speeds that they need, um, then they would be saving energy there. Another instance in that same scenario with the fan is um, many fans, you can get the same CFM, which is how they rate the airspeed coming across the fan blades. Um, you can get the same amount of CFM if you just reduce that motor speed by two hertz. Uh, we won't get into frequency very much, but that's the operational speed of the motor. So if we change that motor by two hertz, which is roughly you know five percent, now we've re reduced our energy consumption by fifteen percent. So pretty could be a pretty large savings there over over years or, or excuse me over days or years in time.
So something else that I want you wanted to point out is uh, when we talk about energy conservation and we think about that water wastewater application, um, another thing that we can look at is total system cost is going to be reduced, right? Um, and if we just look at that application, and this would be the same thing for HVAC applications, just different terminology. Um, in the piping world, is right. We have losses. We have pressure losses and flow losses from. Um, the turns in the piping and even from the valve, right? We have turn down losses from the valve. So all of those system losses put together um, is what signifies or what quantifies the size pump you have. Um, and then based on the size pump you have is how you size your AC motor, right? So here we've identified all of our losses and the pump load and we need a 90 horsepower um, worth of pump, or excuse me, worth of motor, but we don't have 90 horsepower. So we have to go with 100 horsepower. So if we were to take that valve control out of the system and look at a VFD controlled system, um, now we're just reducing the losses, right? So if you look at our valve turn down, it's gone, right? We've minimized our piping loss because we took out all the turns in there. Um, so what does that equal? That equals a smaller pump. Um, in the last example, we had a 15 horsepower pump and here we're able to do it with a 10 horsepower pump. So now we have, um, only 68 horsepower worth of load. So we can get away with a 75 horsepower AC motor. So again, lowering your overall system cost and design cost um, can be an impact as well from energy conservation. And, and um, this could also be used for HVAC ventilation as well, right? And, and duct work. So one of the things, uh, one of the other things I want to talk about on VFD loads types is going to be regenerative loads. Um, these are going to be things such as your cranes and hoists, your downhill conveyors. Um, this is a centrifuge, or this is a common bus system. And um, you think about a regenerative load, this is something that's going to be overhauling the motor. So what we call an overhauling condition of the motor is when instead of us giving a command to turn the shaft of the motor, the load is actually turning the shaft of the motor, which in turn makes that um, motor become a generator. So think about this a conveyor full of rock. It's, it's moving along the ground, it's moving along the ground, it's going up a hill, um, and it comes down the backside of the hill. Well, as it comes down the backside of the hill, all the weight of the rock is actually going to want to pull that belt faster than what the, the motor is actually spinning. So that's called an overhauling load. Same thing in a crane and hoist situation, right? As that crane um, hook goes down, that motor is running that crane hook out, and it's um, excuse me, overhauling that motor, right? It's running that crane hook out and it's it, and the weight and everything of the, of the hook is overhauling that motor. So that's a regenerative load. Um, when we look at regenerative loads, what happens is that AC motor becomes a generator. It takes that power and it puts it back into the drive. Um, on this example here called a common bus system, we're actually running a couple of drives and a couple of motor loads. So think about a conveyor system, right? We've got three different conveyors to get product across our ground. Two of them are flat and one of them's downhill. The downhill conveyor, as it runs, it's always generating power back into the system. So that power is taken from the drive and put back onto the common bus. It's actually feeding into the other drives. Um, that's called a common bus system. Um, most commonly, regenerative loads are done by what we call dynamic braking. And what happens is when that AC motor becomes overhauled and becomes a generator, that AC power comes into our inverter section of the drive and back to the DC bus. Well, the drive has to go somewhere with that power. And what does it do? Commonly in a dynamic braking system is it burns that power off in a resistor. So the result is heat and watt loss. Um, if we look at that in an energy conservation sense, we're wasting energy here. Um, as technology has advanced, what has come prevalent is what we call active front end VFDs. Um, this is a standard six pulse drive, your standard drive that's out there. And this is what we call an active front end drive. The only difference is if you look right here in the front end of the drive is it looks very similar to the back end, the inverter section. We've taken the inverter section and put it in the front part of the drive. And now we're controlling the AC sine wave that we're putting back onto the grid. So instead of burning this power off in our resistor, 
we're actually recreating the power and putting it on the utility line. What does that mean, right? You're giving power back to your local utility company. You're saving money. Um, if you didn't have any loads and you had some type of overhauling load um, and you were actually putting power back onto the grid, right, you would be generating money. Um, typically, when we see regenerative loads, it's either going to be in your common bus type of system where another piece of device is using it. Um, or in a large complex where another where other VFDs are using it um, throughout the power grid. So that's um, as technology advances, VFDs are coming more prevalent with active front ends um, and becoming more and more common and more cost effective to install where instead of burning the heat off, we're actually giving that heat back to the power company and, and in turn um, saving energy as well as as well as money. So I want to take a look at VFDs and power quality um, as, a, as a factor of energy conservation. So industrial users are typically billed consumption charges, demand charges, and power factor penalties. So often overlooked um, are going to be the last two, demand charges and power factor penalties, right? Consumption charges are, are just that. They're charging you on what you use. Um, we may not be familiar with power factor penalties because in this area of St. Louis um, and surrounding areas, power factor really isn't prevalent um, as far as penalties. Uh, we have as much power as we can produce and the company um, will give it to you. And we're going to talk about the relationship of what power factor is in a minute for those that might not understand. Um, and typically the power factor, what we look at is anywhere of greater than 80%, but typically above 90% or better is, is what um, you might be t held at as, as a stipulation before you start getting penalized. Uh, one of the things I want to show is this nice visualization of demand charges. So here is a chart that shows demand charges by dollar per kilowatt hour. Um, and we'll look at a kilowatt hour example here coming up. But so you can see basically all of Cal you know, most of California is greater than $30 per kilowatt hour. Um, that can start adding up fairly quickly for an industrial user. Um, and then you can see, you know, here in our local area, we're pretty light. So we're at zero for most of the areas. Um, as you get into the, the outer, outer line areas um, for like Three Rivers Electric and down in down on 44 in that area, um, they actually do charge for demand charges. So you'll see a one to, one to $10 range for that KW. Um, so demand charges are relevant in our area. Um, you might've heard of them before, or you might've had discussions with customers um, but demand charges are often overlooked. Um, a lot of the times the, the electrical bill, right, is not, is not paid by um, the person um, that's paid by the accounting people, right? So it's not paid by the maintenance team that might be working on the electrical, electrical equipment, it might not be, um, be paid by the engineers that are designing the equipment. So we don't often think about these type of things. And, and quite frankly, demand charges are often overlooked. Um, demand charges are fees that are applied to a bill based upon the highest amount of power drawn any 15 minute interval during a 15 period, or excuse me, during a billing period. So what that comes down to is the electric company takes a look at 15 minute interval on your billing period and they calculate a demand charge based on that. So let's take a look at an example, right? So if we use our water wastewater um, example, we think about they have 700 horsepower worth of motor load. Um, if we think about that in KW, because that's what the utility company charges, that's roughly 500 KW. Um, so 500 KW is normal operation. Every day, um, they have a 100 horsepower motor that must start to keep up with the gallons per minute of flow that they need. So 100 horsepower multiple times a day starts as a helper motor to keep up. So Instantaneous demand is roughly six times that 100 horsepower motor. If you remember um, the direct across the line starting in our, in, in our version, or excuse me, our uh, visual of the car, the car tires burning out, um, an instantaneous start on a motor is what we call inrush, has what we call inrush current. Um, inrush current can be anywhere from six to 10 times nameplate. And we're, for here, this example, we're using six times. So to get that motor up and spinning to speed really quick, it takes roughly six times the amount of power for an instantaneous second. 
Um, and in this example is roughly 450 kW. So how does that play out in our plant? We have 450 kW instantaneous worth of power. We have 500 kW worth of normal power. So, we, so the utility company has to provide us with 950 kW worth of power at any given time, right? Uh, we're only using 500 the normal, but at any given time, we have to use 950. And that's because we have one one horsepower motor that's instantaneously starting across the line at any time, right? Direct across the line starting. Um, if if you were to um, take this example and 900 and you and we've equated you know equated to 950 kW, um, that's the demand charge. The the electric the the utility company has to provide you with 950 kW. So the demand that you're going to be asking from them is 950 kW. So if you put it in perspective that um, pictorial of North America that we've seen. Um, California is greater than $30 per kW, right? So um, you can do the math, the demand start, demand charges would start to add up. This is just an example of the 700 horsepower motor load. There's a lot of industrial users out there that use a lot more than 700 horsepower motor load um, when combining all the motors in a facility. Um, so demand charges are something that are often overlooked, but um, can, can handle substantial can have a subs substantial effect on, on, on the utility bill. Um, so if we were to take this example and we were to put a VFD on there, now we've reduced our instantaneous demand, right? And how did we do that? Well, that's we did that because our inrush current got demand. Our uh, inrush current got removed. So if you remember the direct across the line starting going from instantaneous or going from a stop to an instantaneous start, um, and then you have a soft starter. The soft starter just slowly starts the motor. Um, that soft starter still has some amount of inrush current to get that thing going. A VFD starts actually from zero speed and has no inrush current to get that motor spinning. Um, so uh, if you were to have a soft starter on this, you might reduce your instantaneous demand by half. If you had a VD, VFD on this, you would, you would reduce your instantaneous by um, to zero, right? You would have no inrush current. And I bring this example up because um, working with a large um, pet food manufacturer in the area, um, in, a, in a rural area, um, local rural area, they have two grinders, right? These grinders are the highest horsepower loads of the plant. And they were seeing heavy, significant demand charges when they would have to start and stop the demand the grinders. Um, they started and stopped the grinders several parts a day, several times a day. Um, they actually had soft starters on those grinders. Um, we went in and reviewed the application for VFDs um, and we're using VFDs. So they were installed on the application and the customer indicated that the cost of the install and the VFD was paid for back in two months, just simply on their demand charges, just from going from that um, soft starter current inrush demand charge to a to a um, VFD that that several hundred horsepower motor load grinder is now not their 15 minute target window for their demand charge. So they saved quite a bit of money on there just by putting a VFD on this motor and reducing their demand charges. So that's something that's often overlooked, but it shouldn't be. <coughs> I wouldn't be uh, properly supporting my products and teaching you guys about drives if I didn't talk about VFDs and power quality, right? Um, if we really look at the relationship between VFDs and motors and AC power, um, VFDs do create anomalies for AC power. One of those anomalies are what we call harmonics. So as the AC drive, or as the AC drive takes that AC sine wave and creates the output for the motor, it puts off harmonics onto the AC line. This is an example of a, har um, of a harmonic current. And this is an example of a harmonic voltage. So that AC sine wave that, that everything likes to see, this nice sine total 60 hertz sine wave that Nikola Tesla created, um, is now starting to look like this. And as you can see here in this graph, as we add harmonic distortion, as we go up in percentages, it really starts to distort our AC sine wave. So what does that do, right? Um, how does that affect 
or what, why do we care about that? What, how, what does it make any difference, right? We're talking about VFDs. We kind of established that it's kind of a no-brainer on why wouldn't you have VFDs on every motor, right? Well, there is, there is drawbacks to VFDs, and one of those is power quality um, and putting back some of this harmonic distortion. So you have to look at a level of linear and nonlinear loads. Linear loads are what we call um, loads that run on this nice sine and sodial waveform, such as your lights, such as your motors. Um, once you put a VFD, a nonlinear load, something that creates its own, its own waveform, um, that is putting power quality or harmonics back onto the line. Um, as we go up in that harmonic distortion, right, we're starting to store that more and more. So if we take a look at how that actually affects us, I think everybody can relate to either a glass of beer or you know, just your glass of Coca-Cola. Um, and this is representative of the utility company, right? They're the bottle that has as much Coca-Cola or as much beer as you can pour. And our facility is the glass, right? So our facility has been designed. Um, we have as much capacity as we've, we've designed it for. Utilities given us as much power as we can ask for. Um, but we have a lot of drives in our system and we have harmonics on that line. Our harmonic distortion is quite high. Um, so how does that affect us? Well, harmonic distortion is the foam, right? It's the, it's the foam or the fizz that's coming over the top of the beer um, that's wasting. So if we take away that foam, that fizz, what's left? Well, we've designed a system for this much capacity, but our harmonic distortion is saying, hey, here's our real work that we're going to get done out of that, all that power you're giving me, and I'm going to waste the rest of it. I'm going to burn the rest off it into the air, and then the rest of it's going to be in my distribution system for remaining capacity. So herein lies where we're going to, where we call power factor, right? The, the utility company calls that power factor. Um, they say, hey, you have enough harmonic distortion where you're giving us a 90% power factor. The, all the power that we're putting in, you're only using 90% of it. We're basically um, burning off the other 10% of it. That's what's called power factor. Um, a lot of areas such as California have strict power factor regulations. Um, again, St. Louis is not one of those. Ameren will happily give you 100% of power if you want to waste 50 of it. That's, that's by your means, right? Um, but what does that look like in actual facility? Um, what that does in a facility is nonlinear loads, uh, excuse me, linear loads that are to made on run on that AC sine wave are now looking at that distorted sine wave. They're looking at the sine wave that has all those notches on it. And what that does is it overheats components um, that creates heating effects. And um, you will have to oversize your infrastructure. So again, you have to mitigate those harmonics. You have to look at um, either coming to a standard for harmonic mitigation, where you're actually reviewing your nonlinear loads. So out of all your loads in a facility, um, is, is, are, are they greater than 20%? Then you probably start to look at like harmonic mitigation. Um, and this is how we, how we rectify the problem that we're putting on the AC power line by reducing some of our energy. Right. Um, another one that you might have heard about is IEEE 519. This is a standard that actually states you can only have 5% harmonic distortion on the AC power line. In today's world, IEEE 519 is coming a lot more prevalent, and active front end drives are actually built and constructed to, to maintain the IEEE 519 standard. Um, so those are going to be coming more prevalent and more active um, more and more. Um, so again, the VFDs are, are very good to control the speed of the motor um, and reduce our energy consumption, um, but they do play a negative effect on the power quality that we have to that we have to be cognitive of, and we do have ways to mitigate, right? Um, so how do we mitigate that harmonic um, issues? And some of those solutions could be an isolation transformer. Um, this would probably be your best solution, but often the most costly solution. Um, think about all the VFDs out there. An isolation transformer would say that um, for every power coming in, you put in an isolation transformer in front of every drive, right? That could get fairly expensive. Um, that's a high cost item. Um, but what that does is it isolates the circuit from the main power. So any negative effects from that VFD that are being put onto um, the power line are not being sent back up to the utility company. Um, the most commonly used item today is a line reactor. It's the same function of a transformer in a sense that 
Um, it isolates some of the negative effects by adding inductance to the circuit. And that inductance helps pull down some of those spikes and some of that harmonic distortion. Um, and these are what we call line reactors. Line reactors are also um, one of the cheapest ways to ensure the protect the line side of your drive from any power anomalies from the utility company. Um, so you'll very often see line reactors and VFDs used hand in hand. Um, if you're looking at complete systems, you might be looking at um, adaptive and passive harmonic filters. Um, so these are actually filters that add inductance and capacitance to a circuit, um, and, and it helps smooth out that sine wave to a more perfect sinusoidal linear sine wave. And then and as technology advances, active front end VFDs are coming more and more prevalent. Again, this is taking the output of a of a VFD and putting it on the input side and then controlling that AC sine wave to manipulate the power back onto the line to create a nice pretty AC sine wave. So um, there is ways to mitigate those harmonic um, residencies that the drive is putting off. So as a review for the presentation, right? Um, conserving energy is continually growing in popularity. Um, it's dri being driven by really federal, state, local resources, and also in today's world, right? Um, the, the new generation um, are, it really believes that the carbon, you know, our carbon footprint needs to be reviewed. And conserving energy is one of those. That's just like your car starting and stopping, right? That's a way to help reduce the carbon emissions. Um, electrical conservation, of course, can have large financial impacts. And I think most importantly, plays a, a big role in our future generations. Um, we now know that electric motors make up 50 to 85% of all generated electric. So I could see why that would be an easy target. And variable torque loads on fans and pumps follow affinity laws, and we can really get some energy, reduce energy savings out of those. Um, as you know, technology advances, I'm sure there's going to be more and more products out there to be, make a healthier environment, right? To mitigate some of those harmonic solutions, to reduce some of that um, inrush current for your demand charges, um, and, and create a better power factor, and just create an overall healthier environment. Um, I hope that you know me talking to you today kind of gives you a better understanding of VFDs, electric motors, and how they can how they can help you know, minimize um, financials and they can also help in energy conservation. Um, if there's any questions, I'll review the chat real quick. Feel free to chime in. I know we're gonna have a, a round table session coming up. I appreciate you guys for your time and also appreciate you for having me on and, and let me uh, speak to you about the VFDs and energy conservation. I appreciate it, Chris. That was a great presentation. Uh, so, yeah, if anybody's got any questions, feel free to unmute and ask. Um, check the chat here. See if there's anything. Looks like I'm not seeing anything in there, but make sure we give everybody some time if they want to unmute. Um, I remember yeah, so back, back, in the, uh, back in the early 90s using a bunch of... Uh, 1336 drives out at MEMC. Now those were pretty, pri uh, what, primitive compared to the modern drives? Yeah, so 1336 was actually one of uh, Rockwell's first drives out to market. That was actually one of the first few VFDs out to market in the early 80s. Um, 1336 is actually, there's some of them that are still be around, that are still around today um, and used. Um, 1336, um, is now equivalent to what we call a PowerFlex 753, but essentially the technology has advanced. Um, if we, if you remember the slide where we talked about the different motor control methods from a VFD, um, sensorless vector, volts per hertz, and flux vector, your 1336 drives would have just operated on a simple volts per hertz curve. That means we're just putting out um, 60 hertz at 480 or 230 volts, and everything in between then is, you know, um, linear. Now in today's world and sensorless vectors, we're actually changing that relationship of voltage and frequency to the motor um, and controlling that. So yeah, good, um, good, good example there of seeing the 1336 a long time ago. And actually there's a lot of those still in, still in operation um, today. I'm seeing a question uh, is in regards to um, bearing etching, any experience with bearing etching. So yes, I will say that 
Uh, we didn't talk about all the aspects of VFDs, but uh, one of the things that bearing etching is, is a, a VFD, that pulse width modulated output that a VFD puts out is actually bad for the AC motor, right? Nikola Tesla invented the AC induction motor to run on his AC induction sine wave. Um, when we create a pulse width modulated output, what we're actually doing is there's, think of it as a bunch of light switches in there. We're turning off signals very fast and we're, and we're sending pulses out to that motor to make it look like a sine wave. So what happens is those switches, just like when you would pull like your vacuum plug out of the wall and you see an arc, you see that flash or static electricity, you see that little flash. Um, that happens on a drive and that's called a voltage spike. Um, and in a VFD, if you have a 480 volt motor, you can actually have voltage spikes up to 1500 volts coming out of the output of the motor. And again, this is for very um, minute microseconds. Um, so you would never see that unless you were to put like an AC scope on there. Um, but what happens is that that spike goes out to the motor and if there's not a good grounding path from, from the VFD to the motor, um, that spike has to go somewhere, has to go to ground, right? And what happens is that spike goes down through the windings, goes through what we call the motor stator, that's the stationary winding that the motor runs off of, and it goes through to the rotor. And how it does that is through the, the motor the bearings, right? Um, the motor bearings are going to be taking that spike and running it through it. So bearing etching becomes when that bearing is rotating around, those flashes happen in between the balls um, and, and you get that bearing etching. And again, that's, a, a, that's more of the pulse width modulated output um, for, the, for the output of the drive. Uh, we have ways to mitigate that actually, and it's called um, output filtering. So just like a line reactor, a lot of times we use a load reactor um, and then when you get out into multiple, you know, um, several hundred foot of distance, we also talk about like DVT filters and stuff. Basically, what we're doing is putting in place, you know, places to to uh, make that pulse with mo pulse with modulated output more look more like an AC sine wave to the motor to mitigate some of those effect damaging effects. Uh, can a VFD be a beneficial on a home HVAC motor? Yes, sir. Um, that it, that can be beneficial depending on you know how you set things up, right? Um, you could have, you, if you had like zone systems um, and you wanted to run several fans, um, there's definitely automated systems that utilize VFD technology and pumps and fans and in, in home systems. Um, yeah, so one of the questions is when talking about harmonics, this reduces the overall power that can be supplied to a facility. Um, so in a sense, this what harmonics do is it doesn't reduce the overall power that can be supplied to the facility. Um, it reduces the amount of power that you're efficiently using at your facility would be a good way to put that, right? The 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 utility company will supply you as much power as you want to want as you want. Um, let's say you had 100 amps worth of power being supplied, or your home 200 amps worth of power being supplied, um, and then you had harmonic distortion on the line that created a 10 uh, 90 percent power factor. Well, that 200 amps 90 percent, right? You've just wasted that 10 percent of power. That's what harmonics does for you. So hopefully. Uh, Michael, that, that cleared that up a little bit. Um, I see another thing here, and I know we're running up against our one o'clock cutoff. So um, we're going to touch on replacing old DC motor drives with the newer um, AC drives and motors. What's the main advantage? Assuming the 755T will handle torques just fine. What is the difference in power use? Okay, so a couple things here. Um, I Hey, kudos to Mike King for knowing about the 755T. Um, that's one of our newest drives to market. And I say that the 755T high horsepower has been around for several years now. Uh, we're just now getting into the smaller horsepower. And in a future release, we're gonna have the 755TS for more of a standard drive. Um, the 755T is our active front end drive. So uh, when we talk about active front end, we can talk about low harmonic. 
Um, that's meeting that IEEE 519 standard. It says 5% harmonic distortion at the AC line terminals. Um, so in a, in a scenario where you're using the 755T to replace a DC motor, um, you know, there's a, there's a discussion around DC motors and AC motors. Um, DC motors, direct current, again, created by Thomas Edison, um, is, was used to create low end torque, right? Uh, DC motor was the only way you could get low, uh, full torque at zero speed. Um, an AC motor for many, many years, you could only get full torque at full speed. Um, so we would use DC for high torque, um, low speed applications. In today's world, the motor control methods of centralist vector and flux vector control, we can actually control the torque relationship of that motor and with the proper torque rated motor, um, typically thousand to one ratio, um, we can get low end torque out of that motor. So, so nowadays we can look at a DC system and you know, for many years as a, being a field service engineer, I replaced a lot of DC systems with AC motors and drives. Um, it really comes down to the question is, do they have any DC motor spares? Um, if they don't have any DC motor spares, then you should be changing that DC motor out with AC. Um, and, and again, the, the application needs to be reviewed for the proper AC motor installation, but there's no reason why an AC motor today can't replace a DC motor capabilities. Um, and as far as what is the difference in power use, for example, thousand horsepower? I might have to get a little more, um, a little more definition on you from that one, Mike. Chris, I appreciate you. Appreciate you going through it. Like I said, guys, if you think of anything, so you know, we appreciate everybody attending today. You know, energy conservation is such an important topic that we wanted to take a deeper dive and cover it from different angles. So, like I said, next month we will finish up the series with a roundtable discussion. So, as Chris had mentioned, we're planning to have each of the presenters back, and we'll have breakout rooms for everyone to rotate in and out of. This will give everybody the opportunity to continue the discussion, dig a bit deeper, or even ask any additional questions that might come to mind. So, uh, I'll be sending the. Uh, that invite should be coming out within uh, within a week, and unless anyone has any additional questions, we well, just, will. Just to add to that, Kevin, yeah, if you yep. missed uh, missed the air presentation on air conservation or Good steam point. presentation on steam conservation, visit our YouTube site, and uh, we are up. Uh, we have both those uh, previous programs up on our YouTube. Yeah, great point. And thank you thank all for your time again. Thank yeah, you, th everybody. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, everybody, no for problem, attending guys. today. Mm -hmm.